सो वक्रतुंड महाकाय सूर्य कोटि समप्रभ निर्विघ्न कुरु मे देव सर्व कार्येषु सर्वदा एट द वेरी ऑनसेट लेट मी विश यू ऑल अ वेरी हैप्पी गणेश चतुर्थी एंड मे यू बी ब्लेस्ड विद हेल्थ विद प्रोस्पेरिटी आई वेदान शर्मा वेलकम यू टू द वेबिनार सीरीज ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय अमिटी लॉ स्कूल अमिटी यूनिवर्सिटी राजस्थान uh amity law school amity university rajasthan has transferred a long journey to attain quality education intuitive recognition of creativity and sparking success in struggle with a vision to encourage brilliance in the field of legal education and to accomplish the ever increasing demand of quality legal professionals in india for a growing legal world it aims to achieve holistic approach wherein learning experience is not only illuminating but also elevating and stimulating the young minds of our students the institute is committed to exploring multidisciplinary approaches through its district curriculum which is designed to give extensive exposure to students uh domestically internationally and in comparative legal subjects uh i'll now like to invite professor dr saroj bora director and dean amity law school jaipur for the welcome address uh professor dr saroj bora is a strong educational professional uh covent educated with proven academic record Uh, madam has demonstrated history of working in the education management industry skilled in administration legal assistance legal research and public speaking professor bora has a distinguished academic career receiving two gold medals in the law uh, during her graduation she was also awarded national merit scholarship 2004 2005 for her academic excellence uh, from jnrn dash university jodhpur an astute professional with 15 years of experience in research teaching administration and industry responsible for the development of academic programs curricula and regulations in addition to preparing and delivering lectures and classroom discussions professor bora has been the driving force behind various national and international events ma'am i request you to kindly address the audience please thank you thank you vedash for that uh, generous introduction <laughs> and at the very outset i would like to welcome a very eminent speaker for the today's webinar dr mahesh utpal sir a uh, welcome sir namaskar and at the same time i would like to welcome all the participants who are attending this today's webinar on a very interesting topic because we have talked about or we have started about the e governance we talked about the digital india we talk about telecommunication but connecting all these three topics would be very interesting and i think it's going to be a learning for myself also because uh, connecting these three points and understanding our rural india in the this digital era where our government is also taking a lot of initiatives and trying to uh, make our country a digital country but our country for ensuring the smooth adoption of the digital space there are certain challenges the major challenge is the population we do compare that this country that country is doing so well but when it we look into the uh, population it's a very very huge because a uh, population of india comprises about uh, of two to three countries in a globe so that is a population of only one country that is india so there are certain challenges like the budget challenges are there there are regulatory frameworks there are implementation the skill enhancements so there are many aspects and then it comes to the rural country now then teaching them making them or getting them to the tech savvy Uh, making them understand what is e-governance so the e-governance has enhanced the reach and accessibility to the public service benefits for our citizens but to understand it and there were there are various challenges so i think with the uh, experience of mahesh sir we all will be benefited and we'll get a deep uh, insight onto this topic and uh, with this small brief uh, welcome i note i would again welcome mahesh sir sir I thanks Vedansh for taking this initiative, inviting my sir for this webinar, uh, and let's hope that we all have a very uh, new learning to take away with at the end of the session. Back to you, Vedansh. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for all those illuminating words. As we all have faced it, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought the world to an halt, and the only possible way out was to go digital. whether it is our education or businesses or other works we all have gone on an e platform today we among uh, we have amongst us dr mahesh utpal uh, director comfort india limited whose talk will expressly focus on india's competency to provide e governance to all while considering the rural digital infrastructure present in our country uh, dr mahesh utpal is the director of comfort india a uh, company based in delhi that advises on policy regulation and strategy 
he was educated at St. Stephen's College, Delhi, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and City University, London. His clients include the governments, international private sector, and civil society. His work is focused on telecommunications in its various roles, including a major industry, utility, and tool for national development, productivity, and uh, competitiveness. Uh, Dr. Opal contributed, uh, contributed extensively to setting up of the India's regulatory body for telecommunications, no, now known as the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. Uh, he has been an active contributor to the most debates in India's communication sector. Opal says comments on telecommunication and related issues are frequently featured in newspapers, radios, and television in India and overseas. Uh, without taking any further time, uh, I'll request Dr. Mahesh Uppal to kindly address the audience. Uh, all are requested to put down their queries and <coughs> questions in the QA data. So please, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Bora. Thank you, Vedansh. Uh, thank you for a very generous introduction. Thank you very much for a very kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to speak in meetings like this and to also figure out where uh, our interests overlap and where we have things to learn and etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is something uh, particularly welcome to me and i'm i'm hoping that uh, we can have an interesting and uh, uh, and an engaged conversation about uh, the issues that we're discussing uh, let me start uh, with uh, would saying that COVID, as you know, is a massive health and livelihood crisis. The crisis has brought focus on some key issues that we are dealing with today, namely government and technology. Let's start with the government. The government alone uh, can take steps like lockdowns, emergency food, controlling movement, disaster relief, economic stability, law and order, security. <clears throat> and similarly, technology, we are relying on technology for testing, for vaccines, for protection, for prevention, for treatment. Besides, of course, uh, relying on technology for financial support, monitoring, safety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, just give me one second. Now, and of course, we know, and as you, uh, Vedansh, mentioned, technology is already helping this, the lucky ones like us. Most of us have smartphones, tablets, TVs. Many more of us can access entertainment and work from home, etc. In fact, thanks to technology, more of us can join for our own meeting today because we are online. A face-to-face uh, -face meeting would have been much harder, much more expensive, and less inclusive. We are today able to include all kinds of people who would otherwise find it very difficult to attend. We are also shopping online. We are working from home. It's true, we are hugging a little less, and our hair might also be a mess, but we can't deny that technology has been a great help to us. On the other hand, those without access to technology not only face the problems that the, that the pandemic is posing to us and huge challenges that it's posing to us, but they also face additional problems. For example, just to give you some, they can't easily work or shop from home. They struggle to keep elders and children occupied, which perhaps some of the more lucky urban uh, uh, users can uh, rely on uh, on television and smartphones. Schooling for them is even more difficult because children now need smartphones even for regular homework. And of course, these difficulties and many more are things that we will also discuss in this, uh, this discussion. But let's come to e-governance. But before we come to that, let's also say that one thing is clear that government and technology are going to be vital in our battle against this pandemic. And they're going to be key to keeping us and our economy healthy. They'll be key to our safety and well-being. <clears throat> and, and one of the main reasons for this is, of course, that government and technology 
are key to solving problems at scale. Remember, India is a huge country with over a billion and three, uh, 300 million uh, uh, residents. And so in such a situation, piecemeal efforts are rarely effective. Challenges like food, education, health, safe, safety, security, which we face on a scale that most countries would find very difficult to, uh, to cope with, certainly cannot be handled without access to, uh, without the involvement of government or technology. Now let's come to our own subject. And what is, the first point I'd make about this is that government and technology are also central to our discussion on e-governance and rural infrastructure. But, <clears throat> But it's also important for us, before we go further, that we actually do a little clarification of the terms that we are discussing. What is the uh, what is government, what is governance, and what is e-governance? Typically, governance is what governments do, while government is about superstructure that has the authority. Governance is about the government, its agencies, and what its institutions, uh, what its institutions do. Government is less, governance is less about authority, but more to do with what people in authority do and how they do it. In this sense, gov governance includes not just what we call government, but it also includes independent agencies like election bodies, courts, regulators, and other bodies that have some kind of authority over us. Now, what is e-governance? E-governance is governance assisted by digital technologies. Governance that, deploy, that uses digital technologies as a tool for addressing problems of uh, governance. And wh why do we want to do that? Because unlike traditional uh, means such as brick and mortar uh, solutions, whether it is our government offices, whether it is uh, other kinds of uh, services that people might access. Digital delivery systems have many important and very useful features. They're non-hierarchical, they're non-linear, they're interactive, and they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So for instance, when you and I access the internet, it doesn't matter who we are, whether somebody uh, senior to us or junior to us is also working, using it, whether it's midnight, whether it is Sunday, or et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, the, because of this, the, uh, this particular method of delivery, it also means that people have the convenience to access information and services uh, at a time and a spot of their choosing. Now, the, so the, the, the key thing is that e-governance not only allows you to provide service, uh, provides services if you're government or government agency and use, and, uh, uh, and, uh, use those services uh, if, you're a, uh, if you're a user, but also allows both sides to interact with each other. So just to sum this, governments are about the superstructure, they're about decisions, rules, their roles, implementation, etc. Governance is about functionality, is what you're trying to do, what are the processes, what are the goals you have. It's not enough to say, we will have a school, we would probably want to know how effective the school is. We would like to know how, uh, not just that there is a hospital, we would like to know how it's functioning, how many people it's treat, uh, treating. So we're worried about performance, we're worried, worried about uh, coordination. We are not just worried about outputs, as they say, we are worried about outcomes. We want to see how, uh, how the targeted uh, people are actually benefiting from governance. And when we talk about e-governance, we are talking about doing all these governance functions 
through electronic means. We are doing consultations electronically. We are controlling things electronically. We are engaging electronically and so on and so forth. And e-governance uh, is not a recent concept. And even in India, it has a, a history of over 15 years. In fact, as early as the early 2000s, the, there has been a national e-governance program. And it's been a very ambitious one. And it has been, uh, it has attempted to address virtually all parts of rural development, whether it is education, health, government decision making, government uh, licenses, government uh, services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, since the on uh, the on uh, the coming on board of the new government, uh, uh, the Modi government, this focus has actually become much sharper. Today, we have even more ambitious goals of. Uh, of, uh, from e-governance. We have, we believe that, uh, as the Prime Minister has said, e-governance also means effective government, governance, easy governance, and many other things. And uh, the Prime Minister has, all, has frequently uh, talked about using and relying on technology as a key tool for governance. And so the it's worth recognizing that the government itself is actually a key player in this e-governance. It's not, not just coming bottom up, it is also coming top down. And the Department of, uh, of Electronics, in fact, there is a, a, a national e-governance division in the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, which which actually has a comprehensive e-governance uh, e program for the country. And it does, it implements a whole lot of those programs and also those of other departments and uh, at both government, uh, central government as well as state government levels. But it's worth just getting a feel for what all can e-governance include. <clears throat> Let me give, uh, attempt to give you a, a snapshot of e-governance applications. For example, we have uh, e-governance applications related to financial inclusion. We are all familiar with Bheem, the Bharat Interface for Money. We are, uh, 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 we are fun, uh, familiar with direct benefit transfer. Similarly, we are also uh, less familiar. Uh, we know, but we are less familiar with uh, applications in agriculture like Krishi Kisan, which uh, informs uh, farmers about best practices. There are soil health cards that uh, that the government is now enabling for farmers to get, which uh, give them uh, customized uh, recommendations for uh, uh, you know how to deal with soil, what kind of nutrients to provide, and so on and so forth. Similarly, there are. Uh, any number of ap uh, applications to do with education. There is a, a, a well-known program called e Shala, which delivers educational resources, uh, class textbooks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, similarly, there is there are uh, applications uh, relating to health. There is, uh, for example, uh, a program called the e Hospital, which enables online appointments, payments, access to diagnostic reports, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is something that, so we get a sense of what the government uh, uh, is trying to do and what the governance program generally is all about. But it's worth questioning at this point or worth uh, discussing who needs e-governance. And the answer to this is a very, trite answer that all of us need it. All of us could benefit from greater efficiencies, convenience, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, However, e-governance uh, is of particular importance and relevance to people with low income, people who are remotely located, people who are less able, pe uh, women and sexual minorities. Now, these are people who traditionally also face huge problems 
in accessing government services, <clears throat> government entitlements, and so on and so forth. And, and clearly, for them, being able to use technology to address some of their problems and some of their challenges is something that uh, is a very, very high priority, should be and is a very high priority. However, government, uh, sorry, governance is not simply about apps and software. This is something that many of us get caught up in, but we know in our hearts, and uh, if we were to think for an extra minute, that it is actually more about access to technology and services. Governance is not simply having access to the apps or being able to download software. Government is, uh, governance, uh, e-governance, is also about being able to access the technology of e-governance and the services that it enables. And this, as you can imagine, is not uh, a, a, an easy challenge in a country like India of, uh, where we have great disparities. And uh, this was something, again, that the e-governance program had understood quite early. And uh, it knew, for instance, that not everybody uh, would have computers at home, not everybody would be literate, not, uh, not everybody would, be, uh, uh, would have uh, software uh, or familiarity or uh, would be savvy with, uh, with, with the internet or uh, electronic services and so on and so forth. So it, one of the ways uh, this was attempted to be solved was by creating uh, what the government called common service centers. And this is again a program that started uh, more than 10 years ago, but is, uh, is and is continuing. And we currently have several lakh uh, common service centers. And what do these centers do? First of all, what is the idea? The idea is that people should be able to access their services, electronic uh, uh, government services closer to their homes. If not at their home, at least closer to their home in a place where they can reach easily. And, of course, and what are the kind of services people could get in, uh, uh, in CSEs or common service centers? They could access uh, all kinds of Aadhaar related services. They could get, uh, uh, for example, applying for these cards, etc., uh, modifying them, editing them. Insurance services, whether it's for crop insurance, health insurance, life insurance. They could also uh, get some assistance uh, in banking because the people who are running uh, common service centers were people who were uh, allowed to act like uh, business correspondents and be, as it were, the, res the representatives of banks. Similarly, people who needed uh, to access their pensions, older people who were, or other uh, people who were entitled to pensions, could also go to these CSEs and get some uh, assistance in accessing uh, those services. Similarly, Others, uh, uh, other facilities like railway ticketing or applying for passports or being able to even get access to some uh, uh, education uh, or educational services. For example, somebody could just learn a new vocation or somebody could, uh, could for instance, uh, uh, learn to uh, use uh, a Microsoft uh, Word. Somebody could... Uh, and learn to uh, fix a mobile phone and so on and so forth. So some of those kinds of facilities were also uh, available and are available. And I think a key uh, thing that the government recognized and from a policy perspective, it, uh, we can discuss this later also, but it's very important. What it did recognize is that the common service centers are not just an opportunity for government people uh, to go and provide these services. These are also opportunities for entrepreneurs in rural areas who might be trained to provide these services, who could therefore get additional means of livelihood. And so it was seen as much uh, as a 
as a means of livelihood generation as it was uh, as a means of delivering uh, government or other uh, related community services to people. <clears throat> now, this is broadly what has been attempted, what is uh, currently being attempted. It's, we can sit back a little and see what the results have been and uh, what has been the experience uh, with the use of uh, e-governance with uh, the with common service centers etc and of course this would be a whole uh, a whole uh, uh, course a whole set of lectures in itself uh, to deal with them in some detail but let me say a few things one is that the results are very mixed most of the times the achievement are far lower than what people had hoped. In fact, people uh, generally find that adaption of technology by rural uh, uh, people is not uh, uniform and not necessarily always uh, uh, very, uh, uh, <clears throat> they, they don't readily adopt technologies, much like urban people for that matter. And also that the numbers where we see successes may in many cases run into lakhs, but usually they run into a few thousands. And even when they run into lakhs, uh, we must remember that for anything to have any impact at scale in a country like India, this kind of an impact should be at the level of crores, of hundreds of, uh, of tens of crores. We are a 134 crore population. So anything in which the, the actual uh, impact is limited to a few lakhs of people uh, is, uh, you might say, not the best result. And uh, it is true that, for example, uh, digi uh, digital transfer of money, money transfer, for example, adoption of uh, technologies like Beam has been much more, and this goes into a few crores, but even then, it is a very small number. As a, as a proportion of, uh, of our population, the, the number is really very small. And uh, so, and one of the key challenges that people find when, when we explore this is poor infrastructure. That for some things like e -govern for, uh, for something like e-governance to work, a lot of other things also have to be in place. We, and let's come to that. And this is really uh, the other part of what we were going to discuss today. And that is <clears throat> that especially in rural areas, the infrastructure is a huge challenge. Because as we said earlier, the apps are good, apps are fine, uh, everything is okay, but they're clearly not sufficient. You cannot do without them, but they're not sufficient. They're necessary, but not sufficient. We still need connectivity. We still need the hospitals. We still need the medical equipment. We still need the doctors. We, did, we still need trained nurses and a whole paraphernalia around that. Similarly, we st still need schools. We still need trained teachers. We need uh, teaching aids. We need a, uh, classrooms and a whole lot of other things, which are a part of, if you like, social infrastructure that we are talking about. So here, when I'm talking about rural infrastructure, I'm, I'm I'm talking about both physical infrastructure like roads and electricity and connectivity, but also social infrastructure like hospitals and schools, which again uh, are central, are very, very uh, key for any effective deployment of e-governance. And let's just get a little feel for that infrastructure. The, the most important infrastructure for e-governance is about that e 
It is about electronic uh, communications. It's about telecom connectivity. In fact, not just telecom connectivity. In fact, there is a, a very uh, uh, important organization called the uh, Alliance for Affordable Internet, and which has actually talked about not just connectivity, but talked about meaningful connectivity. Me, what is meaningful internet connectivity? Which is a precondition, as we said, for e-governance. A meaningful connectivity is something we have when we can use internet on a regular basis, on a daily basis. In other words, it's both affordable and accessible. We, it's meaningful if we have an appropriate device. If we, in other words, we would, uh, we need smartphones and computers and so on and so forth. Similarly, if we have those two and your uh, data, uh, the, your quota that you have on data is not sufficient. If you are, all you have is, a, is, uh, is let's say 500 MB of data per day or whatever, uh, clearly that is not sufficient. So we need enough data as a, which, a, a meaningful inter, uh, in a, internet connectivity includes having sufficient data. And last but not the least, it requires a reasonably fast connection. In other words, speed. So if, unless we have these four things, we have regular access, we have an appropriate device, we have sufficient uh, data, and we have a good speed, uh, we don't really have meaningful internet connectivity, which is, as uh, we said earlier, a precondition uh, for e-governance. And let's see how we fare on connectivity. Let me start with some headline numbers. We have roughly about uh, a, about 1.37 billion people in this country, of which uh, we have about 1.6 billion connections and about 687 million penetration of internet and about 400 million users of social media. Now it's it's very important to uh, to recognize one thing when we share these numbers that these numbers typically all these numbers about connectivity whether it's mobile phones or internet they refer to connections they don't refer to users in fact by most estimates the number of users uh, is roughly about 70% or so of these numbers. So our penetration, our national penetration for mobile telephony is roughly about 70%. And when it comes to internet, it is less than 50%. So you can already begin to see the kind of challenges we will face when we uh, talk about internet governance. Let me go further. Of these half a billion internet connections, Roughly half of the connections are actually, uh, sorry, uh, barely uh, 400 mil million people have smartphones, and even these could be double counted. So the rough, the estimate for actual number of smartphones in the whole country is roughly about 300 million, uh, 300 million you, uh, people with smartphones, and. And you can imagine that when it comes to rural coverage, these numbers become even more problematic. For example, more than 50% of our users in India uh, have a more uh, still depend on 2G, which as you can see, will meet virtually no criteria that meaningful connectivity to the internet uh, would, uh, would require to be met. Similarly, our, our uh, what are called C circles in telecom uh, lingo, which are circles where economic activity is least, have less than 50% access to both telephony as well as internet. So we, uh, when it comes to the people who might actually need uh, e-governance most, the access, the access to infrastructure, the, commun uh, the 
connectivity infrastructure uh, is something that we need to be uh, careful about. Let me also give you some idea about, uh, about costs. In a recent report, which dealt with close to 85 of the most important economies of the world, India's uh, internet affordability was ninth, which is actually rather impressive, given the fact that our broadband speed is second last. We are 83 out of 85. Our <clears throat> our quality uh, internet quality is 78th out of 85. Our electronic infrastructure is 79th. Our data security is 57th. But interestingly, and this is something that should follow from what we discussed earlier, we have a fairly sophisticated electronic government setup. In other words, our government has uh, been successful in actually creating a fairly large e-governance framework. We, are, we have covered a very wide range of services. We have covered a very wide range of uh, regions, specializations, and so on and so forth. So the, uh, we have done reasonably well on the e-governance framework, or, but we have not done as well on other uh, other aspects of electronic infrastructure. Similarly, you can imagine that that we can't expect to be using e-governance effectively if we can't even charge our phones, if we don't even have electricity in our homes, and so on and so forth. And currently, we have close to 34, 31 million homes which are still completely in the dark. There are, we have, uh, as you are aware, reached 100% rural electrification, but that means delivering electricity to the village, not to individual homes. And remember, when we are talking e-governance, we are talking about the last mile, the individual user, the individual citizen, and for him, or her, the not having uh, access to electricity uh, makes actually the uh, becomes a, a major challenge because all the 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 virtues and all the benefits of e-governance e become unavailable for a totally different reason from uh, from the one that most of us would uh, would worry about. I mean, I don't think many people in urban areas think of electricity as a barrier to e-governance, but in rural areas, this is a huge barrier. In fact, uh, I know personally many uh, situations where people do not uh, get enough power to even, uh, uh, even charge mobile phones. They depend on shared services for charging phones. Now, if if you are working with a, a simple feature phone, which is not even uh, always charged, which is not always, it doesn't have sufficient balance to uh, whether it's data or minutes, which uh, is actually uh, a, a low end uh, device, you can imagine what its implications are. <laughs> Similarly, now, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, e-governance might be able to uh, give you, act, you know, uh, enable you to download, let us say, a class textbook. May also be able to connect to uh, you to your school. But eventually, you need to be able to go to that school. Also, you you do want to meet your teacher. You you really do want some face-to-face -face, uh, this thing. But guess what? More than 50% of our rural population lives two kilometers away from road connectivity. A Pakka road, in other words, is actually more than two kilometers away for more than half of rural population even today. And 
So, and our, uh, even as of 2019-20, our, our very ambitious targets are barely half met. So clearly you can imagine that while we might have all those, uh, uh, all the uh, e-governance framework, we might have the, uh, the apps, we might have the software, but the back end or as it were, the part that actually is critical, the part that we want to access is still uh, actually missing. Same thing with healthcare. Now, uh, it's, it's often not known that 86% of our medical visits in India are made by rural populations who travel typically more than 100 kilometers to avail of this facility. 60% of primary health centers, as you can imagine, these are the very basic health facilities in our country, in our villages in our country, have only one doctor. Similarly, our, uh, when it comes to qualifications, a very large number of them do not have any formal qualifications. I'm told barely 58% of the allopathic doctors have qualifications, and in fact, uh, in, when it comes to nurses, barely a third have gone past secondary school and 11, barely 11% 11 have any medical uh, qualification. So these are pretty, uh, pretty worrying uh, statistics for us. And as you can imagine, these are the kind of things that become major barriers to, uh, to the both to deployment as well as the use of e-governance. Let me also uh, give another example, financial inclusion. We, our, we have had exceptional success in financial technologies, as you all know. Our, uh, our uh, UPI system allows for instant transfer of money from one person to another. In fact, it is so impressive and so good that uh, you may have read even Google uh, has asked the US government to implement something similar to our UPI. We've had such massive success in financial uh, technologies in our country. And yet, barely 16% of our rural users have used financial transactions uh, digitally or have done anything in, uh, digital. Barely 30,000 villages out of 6 lakh villages have an ATM. So these are all uh, things from, a, from an infrastructure perspective, from a rural infrastructure perspective, are things that we should be concerned about. Uh, there are, of course, other challenges to literacy is a huge challenge. We are not all, uh, our literacy levels have improved a lot, but when it comes to literacy amongst women, it is still roughly about 50%, while men it is 75% roughly. And you can see that just this disparity in literacy itself will create its own uh, issues in, uh, in, uh, in fair access to these technologies or to e-governance. Same thing in most cases where people are, uh, are looking for services in their own languages, many of them still don't have it. We still do not have support for all the languages. And of course, as you know, in, on the internet, while local content is improving and improving rapidly, there are many languages of our country. And we have close to 30 odd languages, official languages, and several hundred uh, languages, which have more than a million speakers, uh, where the content is very, very sparse, very, very limited. So all these things mean that people also do not have much incentive uh, to actually connect themselves uh, to the internet. And if they don't connect themselves to internet, internet they are not just losing out on uh, things like WhatsApp and other videos, but they are also losing out on larger, uh, uh, larger uh, services such as e-governance. 
and services which are far more important. Uh, and because the, currently our incentives when, when you're poor and when you're marginalized in our country are not sufficient to actually use e-governance. And that is one area that we have not, uh, uh, we have not addressed and uh, sufficiently well. So uh, I told you what e-governance is about, what, how it came about, and what we have attempted to do, how far we have succeeded, and what are the kind of challenges. And I think what is clear uh, from this, as well as from much more that you can also access on your own, is that e-governance is not a full solution it's a very or a neutral solution it is very very uh, it's a powerful uh, uh, powerful approach it rightly very rightly focuses on technology to address complex problems uh, especially complex problems at scale as we mentioned right in the beginning when you talk about solving problems at scale that is when individual efforts or small scale efforts become very, very ineffective. That is when you need governments and that's when you need technology. And so the focus that e-governance has had uh, on technology is one of the better things. And, and clearly it has also succeeded, uh, as I also mentioned, Aadhaar is an exceptionally good example where over a billion people today in this country have a thought. Uh, and fintech, as I mentioned, financial technologies, payment technologies are another example where uh, we have uh, been exceptionally successful. However, e-governance also, as I mentioned, is not a neutral solution. It also is creating its own problems sometimes. For example, as I briefly alluded to, there are uh, some of the people who are uh, uh, who are uh, who are more remote, people who are uh, socially uh, marginalized. Those people are finding it much more challenging to access services. And in some ways, as an academic question, it is worth uh, worth uh, worth asking whether they are actually being left behind because of e-governance, not in spite of e-governance, but because of, because now the people they were competing with earlier are actually even going further ahead because they have access to technology and some others can't. Similarly, the uh, what we have also seen is the fact that e-governance is also about access to infrastructure that if you do not have access to the attendant infrastructure, to the infrastructure that is needed in addition to the uh, to e-governance applications, then things become uh, uh, much more challenging. And there we need to be paying attention to a lot of literature that the development community has created about what constitutes effective access, fair access, et cetera, et cetera. So in short, to, uh, to conclude, the real key to e-governance or, uh, or successful e-governance is access. That if we can, e-governance is what we were using to make access easier to government services. Now our job is to make access to e-governance itself uh, easy. Thank you. I'll stop here. I'll take questions if any. Vedansh. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, th thank you so much, sir. As Mahatma Gandhi said, the future of India lies in the villages. I uh, thank you for this insightful talk, focusing on the Gandhian aspect of uh, village first. I'm very much assured that this session will result in opening new horizons for looking at the stark difference between urban and rural divide, especially in e-governance. And it is my utmost wish that 
this debate, this talk actually resulted into, fu into further informed and intense debate. Uh, with this, sir, we have a few questions and uh, oh. Dr. Rahul Tripathi is the one who has been asking the most of them. So uh, I'll put forward the first question to you. Uh, sir, some apps pertaining to e-governance are disclosing personal information, like by M. Parivahan, anyone, anyone can see details of any vehicle just by vehicle registration number. How is the security of personal data ensured? Yes, I think this is a, a, an extremely important issue and it is uh, rightly engaging a large number of people, both in the policy space as well as in the business space. And clearly these are uh, uh, in India, given our background, many of our apps and their creators would focus more on delivering a service. And I think the focus on electronic uh, security and privacy are issues that we have paid less attention to and I think that part uh, of the problem is dawning now on uh, a lot of our, uh, our, govern uh, our uh, people in government. And I think some amount of work is uh, going on on that. But I'm aware of the problem that Dr. Tripathi is raising. And uh, these are real issues. And they will need to be resolved by uh, people who are uh, uh, in charge of these uh, applications. Thank you, sir. The next question is by an anonymous uh, user. Uh, the question is, sir, in the present context, is there a more governance, less governance sort of structure? A more governance, less government sort of a structure? Sorry, can you repeat the question, Vedant? Sir, in the present context, is uh -huh. there a more governance, less government sort of a structure running. Okay, okay. Well, I think e-governance is really about that. The idea is that we should have more governance and less government. And as I mentioned, in fact, that is precisely where e-governance and its importance uh, comes in. Because in e-governance, we are interested in how things happen. Our goal is to make things happen. Our goal is for objectives, policy objectives to be met, not simply about for orders to be given. For example, the typical government approach uh, is, for instance, to sanction, you know, 40 crores for 10 schools, okay, or 30, 35 crores for some hospital or something, uh, some amount of money for roads. Now, if only it was that easy, if only the issue was just plain money or authority, it is not simply about that. It's more about whether you have created all the other uh, processes that will ensure that your objectives are met. Have you created a uh, effective uh, procurement? Have you created effective planning? Have you created effective monitoring, evaluation, all that? Now, these are all things which actually are a part of governance and uh, not amenable to simple top-down government decisions. So in that sense, I think that is the sense uh, we uh, use this distinction, government, government versus governance. That is what we want less government. We don't want to be pushed around. We don't want to be ordered, but we do want to be enabled, empowered. That's what governance is designed to do. So the next question is from Dr. Tripathi again. Uh, sir, what are the biggest hurdles in implementation of e-governance, excluding the technical aspects? Well, we have discussed uh, many of them, Dr. Tripathi. Uh, we have, you know, the. The, there is, of course, a large issue on the other hand, which many people have talked about when, for example, political will. For example, it's all very easy to have electronic access to land records, which is a very important part of e-governance. 
but as you as we all know over the years access to land uh, and uh, and de- uh, transactions around land have usually been prone to a lot of corruption a lot of abuse of power etc cetera, etc cetera. now uh, the, there are concerns that applications relating to land are not as easy or as helpful as they might be or if you like the progress in making effective uh, apps relating to land uh, records uh, and uh, and land transactions is difficult similarly reporting uh, and ex- uh, reporting let us say uh, some malfunctioning of governance some uh, some problems uh, with uh, let us say policing or whatever now is one thing but to be able to find uh, the, your problems addressed is another thing and again the issue becomes political will and i think many people have said that you can't rely on technology to solve political problems and and not only that and many um, many students of technology themselves know that technology itself comes with its own politics so uh, to treat technology as something totally outside of politics outside of their social context uh, is a is a huge mistake as many many uh, researchers have shown so i do believe that one major barrier that we didn't discuss uh, because we started at a different place is is political will is uh, is the ability to provide the support for e governance uh, amongst people who may feel at least that in the short term that they might be actually adversely affected by providing uh, uh, access to e governance for example we have often said that most people want transparency but some people benefit because there is no transparency so clearly we expect some level of uh, of uh, resistance from it uh, thank you so much sir uh, there is one other question which uh, is actually what are the opportunities in employment generation by e governance is establishment of centers with e myth kiosk or rajiv gandhi seva kendra etc are these are, are these the only areas or is this Uh, scope multiverse no no i i do believe that there are huge opportunities because uh, remember whether it is software hardware whether it is uh, back end support uh, all of them uh, have a huge role for private entrepreneurs the government itself has been uh, particularly focused on involving private sector uh, more and more uh, in uh, in delivery of services which do not require government authority for instance so i do believe of course common service centers uh, were were meant especially to ensure that they led they increased rural livelihoods and employment and once that uh, that model becomes more successful and we can discuss the, unfortunately we don't have time because there are two parts of that success one part is that it will of course uh, mean that many more entrepreneurs will be required to meet the demand that is being generated in these common service centers and many more common service centers themselves will be required there is no reason why there should be only one there's no reason why they should not compete with each other and so on and so forth so there is going to be a huge uh, role for entrepreneurs but of course the other part of this is whether the the common service center can uh, the model itself can uh, sustain the large numbers once it becomes successful for example to be able to uh, to service let us say a request for passport or a registration or something like that for a few 
uh, let's say 30 40 people uh, in an hour may maybe may still be possible but what if you have 500 people coming can you deal with it can a single entrepreneur without as much training do this is this something that will eventually mean uh, a different kind of reorganization of the cac business we don't know but clearly right now the cscs uh, are a source of, op uh, of opportunity for entrepreneurs and and there is no limit on what those services are that they can provide in the cscs so uh, more entrepreneurs will seek to add new services which in turn will require involvement of other people uh, thank you sir yeah. uh, the next question is how does it act facilitate e governance the information technology act that's something which deals purely with law the it act per se uh, is not uh, it's not the key issue in e-governance because it it actually enables e-governance uh, uh, to be carried out it it, pose, it it doesn't really directly address the issues of e-governance so uh, i would say in terms of e-governance it is kind of neutral but yes very soon uh, all those issues that dr tripathi was raising in the beginning which is about privacy, security, et cetera, legal intercepts. All those issues are directly relevant, uh, are, uh, are very much the issues that the IT Act, the Information Technology Act addresses. So to that extent, all these things will, uh, will be impacted by, and all the people providing these services will be subject to those, uh, the provisions of the act. Thank you so much, sir. This will be the last question for the day. It is from Mr. Shobhitav Shivastava. Uh, the question is, sir makes a distinction between in spite of and because of. Is it suggestive of the fact that the conventional manner of governance will be replaced by e-governance or will it survive parallel? Also, will it uh, will not eventually ease the burden on government agencies? No, no. I think the uh, the in spite of and because of was in a slightly different context, but uh, certainly we uh, we do have huge uh, expectations from the governance because it clearly is the need of the hour. I mean, there is no doubt that every country, every region, uh, would do uh, needs the efficiencies and the convenience that the governance uh, offers. Now, the point is that. As far as uh, in spite of or because of, the issue is that some things, for example, the current uh, progress in e-governance uh, is has happened in spite of our poor uh, access to internet. People have been very, very, uh, uh, very uh, innovative in how they got access to internet and so on and so forth. So it's not because e uh, some of the apps are so easy or convenient to use, but people, in spite of them not being so friendly, have managed to innovate and use them for their benefit. So it is in that sense. So you, uh, one is some, you do something because something is good. The other is you get something good out of it in spite of it not being so. So that is the sense in which we are talking about in spite of and because of. Does that answer your question, sir? I believe apparently, yes, sir. <laughs> now, that was a very tricky question and uh, something which is yet to be pondered upon to a very great extent. Uh, but with this, we are actually at the conclusion of this particular webinar. So it's my most pleasure and on the part of our session. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank and you very it much. It will be an honor if you can in person come and grace the, grace the students out here. Some fine day when this COVID, we are done with this COVID. Thank you.
it'll be a pleasure to come anytime. Uh, please let me know. I hope situations improve uh, and uh, we can meet face to face as well. But thank you for the invitation. Pleasure to speak to you. Thanks, thanks from Amity Law School. I uh, thank on behalf of everyone. From Amity Law School, Devon University, Rajasthan. It was indeed a very interesting and learning experience. And it was wonderful to hear you. I, I was engrossed listening to you oh, throughout wow. the session. Generally, I distract without the PowerPoints. So it was very interesting to hear you. Thank you so Thanks. very much. Very kind of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bora. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.